Welcome to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. I'm your host, Tara Rose, and I'm here every episode to expose, uncover, and share what I know about SEX. This isn't what you find in your typical sex ed class. Juicy sex talk is under discussed, and I'm doing what I can to change that. Sex is evolving. People are empowered more than ever to detach from cultural norms and design the sex life they crave. And hey, if you're looking for more after the show, I invite you to get social with me. My Instagram is the.sexed.show, and I would love for you to give me a follow. For most people, your gender is assigned even before you're born into this world. Rarely are you encouraged to explore what gender means to you or how you want to express it. However, things are beginning to shift. More people are exploring their gender and checking their assumptions of what gender is at the door. Exploring gender can be exciting and liberating. Sometimes it can also be a bit isolating, scary, and bring up feelings of grief. For this show, I invited my friend and fellow peer, Jade, to talk about gender and their personal gender journey. Jade identifies as genderqueer and genderfree, living their best life from a body that sometimes has multiple cocks, almost always has a pussy, and can be so switchy they fuck any gender norms right out of the room. If you wanted to learn more about gender, this is the episode for you. (laughs) Uh, And I would also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the territory on what I am sitting on today. I am residing in Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. City of Calgary is also home to the Mades Nation of Alberta Region 3. And like always, I like to invite um, the person I'm interviewing myself and the listeners for this show to a somatic inquiry. This one is called Feelings, Emotions, and Body Movements. And it's just usually a couple of minutes long. For those listening right now, you don't have to participate in this. Um, you can simply fast forward if you'd like. But if this is something that you're curious about, uh, here's an opportunity to try it out. So I'd just like to invite you to get a little bit more comfortable. Breathe into your body. See if there's any movement or any adjustment that you can do to just even get one to 5% more comfortable and take a breath. Feel the breath in your body. (sighs) If you want, you can do a sound or a movement that feels really good and juicy right now. And I'd like to invite you to think about an emotion. Let's choose joy. And if your lips were expressing joy, what would they look like? What would they do? (laughs) Mine are smiling. They're parted a bit. And I can feel the muscles around my lips too. And then maybe feel into the emotion of powerful. And maybe think of your your spine and your vertebrae. And if your spine or vertebrae were feeling powerful, what would they do? I noticed that my spine, my vertebrae is kind of, are more erect, more straight. Kind of feeling like a person sitting on a throne. Just breathe into that feeling. When you're ready, maybe give a little shake and let that go. I got my nipples wet hard. (laughs) 
And I'd like to introduce Jade now. Hi, Jade. Hello. Mm. That was lovely. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for participating in it. I felt when you were thinking of the first emotion, I felt joy coming into my chest right before you said it. And it was just like a bird flying out of my heart. And then you said joy. I'm like, fuck yes. <laughs> I must have like picked that up somehow because I, I didn't feel like I didn't write down before what the emotions were going to be. So yeah, that's awesome. And then the powerful, I felt that in my spine and then you said the spine. So anyways, on point. Thank you. I love that. That's kind of special. <laughs> <laughs> um, so is there anything that I missed from the introduction that maybe you feel you want to share with the listeners right now? Mm, maybe I can just share where I am. Absolutely. I am, please. Um, I'm on my land with my family, my partner and the kids. And we're in an oak grove near a river. There's a lot of cooper hawks and birds and squirrels that hang out here. And we're on Clackamas land um, with a lot of history and a lot of different tribes that have been here for many, many years trading and tending. And the land has been called Portland, Oregon in the last 150 years or so. And I feel really grateful to, to be living close to land right now. I haven't always been given that opportunity so I want to invite in this land you might be able to hear it through my microphone the birds and the wind and all of the gorgeous oak trees and give my honor to the history of this place I can walk in, in a way that honors uh, the precarity of my positionality and also my love for humans and nature mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's like, for those people can't see, but I was watching little birds, uh, I think woodpeckers in the background, they're climbing oh. up the tree. I was like, ooh, <laughs> how special. Mm, yeah. Yeah, the and, paradox. Right. The beauty and, and the struggle. Yeah. Yeah. But the nature keeps on reminding us. Uh, we're alive. <laughs> Does it ever, every day. <laughs> mm. um, and Jade, I'm sure people heard in the introduction, but would you be willing to share your pronouns as well sure, for those listening? Yeah, yeah um, I feel most seen and also it feels so good to feel it in my body when people use they, them pronouns just like very neutral gender to me. So that's where I landed. <laughs> mm, thank you. Mm, so Jade shared that they would really like to I, I like storytell for this, which mm. I am really on board for. I think that's a beautiful way of not only educating people a little bit more about the diversity of of gender and sex and sexuality, but it's, I think people just like to listen as well. Like it helps them relate a little bit more. So Jade, if you're willing to share, how, how did you discover that you were gender queer? And perhaps maybe you can also explain what gender queer means because up until like three, four years ago, I, I didn't even know what it meant. So I'd really appreciate if you could discuss what that is, and then maybe share some of your story and your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Genderqueer feels like another umbrella term that, similar to queer, that can encompass a lot of different identities. So it, in some ways it's vague and in other, like for good reason, and other ways it feels um, sort of like a party. Like you're genderqueer, great. You know, I don't know exactly how you got here, what your experience is, but I feel a resonant like pathway of, of life with you. So to me, it's just not binary. So not cis. And also to me, it feels like the ethics of queer, which is like kind of always unfolding and always sort of asking questions and diving deeper and not being satisfied with boxes. So mm. for me, that applies to both sexuality and my gender. 
So often I actually say I'm queer as fuck because it's hard to say I'm queer and gender queer. I'm just like, I'm just queer as fuck. And I love it when we can slip in words that have power and multiple meaning into um, something that like applies to a deeply embodied feeling and sort of rattle our ideas of like, these words shouldn't be said or they're only for anger or turn on. So that's kind of what I think of when I think of gender, queer, queer as fuck, all those terms. And of course, it's an evolving process for my own journey. So Mm -hmm. you could ask me this question in a year and I might have a a whole different spin on it or a different word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like based on what you experienced and what you've learned and yeah, yeah, definitely. Culture changes so quickly, especially with queerness and gender. Yeah. It seems to be the case more than ever too. Like, yeah. Certainly in the last five years, I've noticed quite a shift with that. Yeah, yeah, it feels really both exciting and I I keep using this word precarious, (laughs) you know, as things become more seen and Mm -hmm. they also become more targeted. So Mm -hmm. true. Yes. And we'll, I want to talk a little bit more about that later on too, of Mm -hmm. what that means. Like, when did you start realizing that the gender queer life was for you? And that's like, how did you even learn about it? Mm, yeah. Well, I think the question is really like, when was the gender queer life in me identified? Yes, you know, like, yeah. when did I um, realize? And going back, it's really like when I realized that the binary existed, because as a young kid, I didn't have. I had wonderful parents and they did not force me into specific roles or I would say costumes, but, you know, kids clothes. (laughs) And it took, you know, there was different moments throughout my childhood where I realized, wait, I'm supposed to be doing something else. Or there's some expectation that I wear this dress. Oh God. Like, and now everyone's treating me a way that I really feel like powerless in and I'm supposed to be pretty. That's really not me. So I feel like I learned who I was by realizing there were these particular binary boxes that I couldn't fit into. And I experienced quite a bit of othering and otherness in social settings as a kid, really not knowing how to relate to girly girls and also boys not really always wanting to include me in what they're playing with. So it was sort of a tapestry of, you know, finding myself as a young kid wanting to wear boy shorts for swimsuit and being totally good with that until maybe age 10 my dad was like okay we need to you need to wear um a top now and I was like I remember breaking my heart (laughs) like taking away this freedom that I felt so you know was fully me and it really broke my relationship to my chest because then it was like okay these these things that are starting to grow here are the reason why I can't feel free in my body and have the clothing that I want and wear what I want when I go swimming and the dysphoria of having you know like a bikini top and like that tight crotch swimsuit you know I'm just I'm still not into that and that was definitely a marker of when dysphoria really started for me Mm. and I think the combination of like feeling pressured to fit in with like, but this isn't me and not having any models or context or labels really put some shame, some hiding, some self-disgust and um, sort of like predicting othering, you know, predicting that I don't belong, Mm -hmm. looking for those signs in groups. So, you know, it, it was like, that was sort of the young journey. And then I realized I was gay early on in middle school. And I was like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, fuck. Like, don't tell mom like this feeling of like ah this is already like I already feel shame about who I am and now we're going here with sexuality so it was some hiding and and then in high school though I of course like you know my consciousness grew my awareness grew I found a girlfriend and I realized like oh no it's not uh oh I'm gay it's like fuck you I'm gay and mm. so there was a lot of like angst and cutting off hair and being 
so much in ownership of my sexuality, but it really didn't connect to gender for me. And sometimes it does for people, sometimes it doesn't. It didn't at the time, but it did allow for me to feel like, okay, there's some sense here around my othering. Like I have other, I have other others to be with, you know, like the outcasts can unite. And that was really important for me. After high school, I was started to date cis men for the first time. And I, I felt like I was able to explore both my double gayness, which is like, I can, I can be, how do I explain this? Like I am queer, I'm gay. And I can be that sort of with anybody who wants to play with that. And And it may look like a cis straight relationship, but if we're both going to play in gay ways, and I'm I'm not even going to articulate what that is. I think people either know or they'll find out there's a way of like being double gay with any, you know, with somebody who maybe looks like they're cis and I look like I'm cis. So, Mm -hmm. and of course I'm, I'm sort of interchanging and I, I'm finding that easy to do and also problematic interchanging sexuality with gender. So cis is a gender term as trans is a gender term, straight is a sexuality term, queer is a sexuality term. So what I really mean to say, and this is important, is being looking like I'm in a straight couple and being able to play with my gay self and my partner's gay self and mm-hmm. and like that feeling like the double gayness. And so that allowed me to kind of flow into a space where I also got to explore my femininity and I hadn't done that before. And it was very painful <laughs> and sometimes pressured. But also I knew that there was like these missing pieces to my relationship to myself and my intimacy to who I am. Because I had really disregarded it as a kid. And and then in middle school and high school, like was very anti uh, my own femininity. It felt very dangerous. It mm-hmm. felt like it would be taken advantage of. And I saw like the performance of it and could not relate. So in my twenties, I did start to explore like what my femme wants, like what brings pleasure in that way. And I joined a dance troupe and pleasure coven and like kind of just went for it, (laughs) which is kind of how I do things. And so there was a ton of healing, especially in this belonging piece with other women But at the same time, there was always this undertone that I was swimming upstream and I was, it just took a lot of extra energy to be in groups with women. It's hard to like describe, but it's a very much embodied experience. Like I'm tracking things differently. I'm, I'm picking up like comments to me differently. And over time I started to realize there were words people were using to talk about the group that didn't land for me. Like, Hmm us powerful women or ladies sister you know and all incredibly beautiful terms and I love them and they didn't really land for me and they didn't work so it was very much a body-based inquiry I was like "Ooh, this is like bringing up my dysphoria again how do I fit in and also honor like that my body is like not okay with the she her pronouns now and it was sort of like water in a bucket you know it's been going all of my life and eventually yeah. it hit the top and it overflowed. And I was with somebody who was also exploring their gender. And so it made it so much easier for me to be honest about the questions I was asking and be honest about the sensations I was having in groups and started to explore different pronouns and took on a different name that felt less feminine, less sort of sexualized from the get go. And started to find community. So that was a huge mm-hmm. piece, was just finding other people who also had been socialized female and did not uh, agree with the boxes and had more you know, exploration in, in their relationship to their self and their body, which is really what I think gender can be about. Of course, like the external world's important, but I had to get clear in this journey that I was really oppressing myself when I was pretending, you know, to be a woman my whole life. And, and that really ties in with the work I was doing around my whiteness and understanding racism, because I realized, oh my gosh, like I've done all this intellectual knowledge about oppression, but 
it wasn't until it came into my body that I could feel like my own inner oppressor that I realized what I had been stuffing down and and keeping small just so that I could fit in, belong, and not be threatened. You know, my gender journey really coincides with unwinding whiteness journey and understanding systems of oppression. Wow. My mind is like blowing trying to process all of this right now, but the amount of what, what, what's, what's the term I'm looking for? Just being able to look into yourself. Like that is unbelievable. Like even from a young age to be that self-aware, that's what I'm thinking of that self-aware. I mean, it took me a long time to start to be that self-aware. There's so much people pleasing involved that I didn't realize I started to have a choice until like, literally till I started somatic school, mm. you know, that really mm-hmm. started the whole questioning everything and doing that self-reflection and understanding that what came up for me and my body surrounding stories we've been told our whole life surrounding being white surrounding being born a female, like very, wow. (laughs) That's so, (laughs) yeah, I'm just, I'm blown away. (laughs) Hmm. So you kind of touched on it, like how sex sort of supported your gender journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would have to say the same kind of goes for me. It was, it was my sex, my sexuality that started me questioning more my journey, my gender and I'm pansexual. And I think that's when I started realizing like, well, if I don't necessarily see gender as something that I'm attracted to, like just women or just men, how can I just label myself as as that. And that started the process of unraveling for myself. What, mm-hmm. what did that look like for you? Did, did that change anything? Cause like you said, not everybody has that intertwined. Yeah. Yeah. Being double gay really helped <laughs> early on when I was with, you know, straight ish men, I would say, because I invited them into a type of play and, and creativity that allowed for me to really express something primal you know yes. it's not an intellectual thing I'm not like google gender queer upload got it <laughs> <laughs> and so from a young age having sex it was always pretty queer and what I love about queer sex is it has to be creative and we don't see that many examples of it I mean more media is growing in the regards of inclusivity but it's Every time is different. Um, and I noticed that with especially my current partner, um, who's also genderqueer and wonderful, and being able to kind of be like, what's here now in my body? What's here now in your body? If it's a group, it's like even more exponential. I was just about and to say that. <laughs> yeah, totally. And it's and things change, you know, like so what somebody is experiencing and, and feeling and expressing can shift me into another way of expressing because it's just, again, it's just like an, a spectrum of ways of relating and a spectrum of ways of feeling in the body. And mm-hmm. sex is like, you know, our playground as adults. It's our way of connecting and playing and being improvisational. And I think that it's so beautiful how it can invite improvisation because that is intimacy like we get to be in the moment creating something creating you know movement creating sound creating sweat creating connection that is like unknown from our brains you know and and i think that that is very much a way of getting out of boxes and a way of getting out of a type of rigidity that colonialism has imposed on us Mm -hmm. so i think sex is so powerful and it's where I realized I have an astral cock. So like imaginal genitals, like, fuck yes, of course, let's talk about it. Let's use narration and lovemaking of these things that are maybe not physical, but they can become energetic and you can feel them on a physical level. Can we narrate what's happening to each other with that and like really light up what's happening in the, in the room, in our bodies, because we have this capacity to use our brain as a sex toy. Mm-hmm. and we have the potential to have all sorts of genitals anywhere we want, you know, at any time. 
if we tune into that imaginal space. So it has been a pretty expansive, deep well to play and also like see, you know, see others, see the people I'm playing with and see them move through a type of like, sometimes a struggle into like a liberatory framework or liberatory embodiment. And, and often there's grief, you know, at the end for me, it's like, whoa, there's so much play here that kind of blew my mind. Now I get to grieve the ways in which I had constrained myself or, or felt shame around this desire. And like, what a fucking amazing tool sex can be in our healing and in our discovery and in our community building. So yes to exploring you know for those who want to be sexual and have you know connections they feel safe enough to explore that with i think that there's a lot of juice there for our gender journeys yeah oh my god totally i i think about this time i was at like a sex party pretty big one like a hotel takeover and i was feeling a little bit vulnerable being female And so I put on like this strap on and walked around and like the energy that I gave off and like, just, it, it was a whole different vibe than Mm. walking around in lingerie, Mm. you know, like it was so powerful. Like what was different? (laughs) I have my own experience, but I'm curious. Well, it was, it was different in that like cis men were a little bit like, not not approaching me like I wasn't approachable to them however more women would come up and you know I was with my partner who's a cis man and yeah it just I just felt powerful with it like did you notice that you like wanted something like different things different ways of interacting yeah definitely like I didn't want to be the receiver I wanted to be the one like pursuing and giving the energy, giving the pleasure, being more in control of things, like more dominant energy. Absolutely. I think anytime I put on a strap on, that's kind of what happens. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Like, and I'm lucky that I, I do have a partner who is open to exploring that stuff too, because for me, sex is so much more than just penetration. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. I'm sweating. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the visual of you walking around a what is it, hotel takeover sex party with a strap on. Yeah. And it's so um I almost said ballsy. That's so ballsy. Did the strap on have balls? No, I'm kidding. Um, um, I just, I'm trying to remember. I don't, th- I think it did actually. <laughs> just imagine like an elevator opening and I'm standing there with like a strap on and no top. Like, <laughs> yes, I love that. I mean, I love that we get to have multiple, you know, it's just like, let's gender fuck our brains, you know, let's get out of this idea that if we have voluptuous breasts, we can't have XYZ. Like, that's just not the case at all you know Mm -hmm. that's not honoring so many different genders inside of intersex you know it's like it's not honoring so many different like deities in lots of different cultural pasts that have multiple genitals so anyways I love that visual for you and (laughs) I hope to reenact it one day (laughs) yes and also just like could there be a you know trans gender queer non-binary xyz sex party takeover hotel i would love that you know there is um a podcast the swing set and they take over this resort called desire and typically this resort is very like anti-lgbtq but when they take it over because they buy all the rooms it's all about like trans non-binary like get your freak on. And um, I love it. I I want to go to it one day. I've never been, but from what I heard, it's amazing. Everybody who goes there is very happy with their experience. So I would love to do more like that. I'm curious, is it, is it put on by trans folks? Um, I don't think they're trans, but they're definitely not straight. 
mm-hmm. all of them. So it's, I mean, it's getting there. There's momentum with it. Mm-hmm. And to see mm-hmm. events like that happen is exciting. Yeah. Like we used to do monthly meet and greets for the lifestyle non-monogamous community here in the city. And when I start doing them again, I want to make it like sex positive socials instead of just focusing on like more straight couples. I want to involve more of like the larger community of gender queer and really start to shake things up because I find the lifestyle to be a little bit based on colonization and it's Mm -hmm. like more Mm -hmm. of the binary you see and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's just more fun when there's when when there's tits (laughs) and a strap on like come on (laughs) so that's that's my hope for the future down the road Mm, beautiful Hmm. One thing that comes to mind is somatic gendering. I I feel like that's kind of something you did most of your life without even knowing that you were doing it. And mm-hmm. it's something that we're introduced to in school. And it's something I'm kind of using to explore my gender right now. Like what, what are some ways that you've somatically tuned into your gender that maybe other people might find helpful or something like Mm -hmm. they can do to like a little bit explore because maybe they're listening and they're like wow I kind of resonate with this but like what are some stories or some big things excuse me that happened to you that you're like wow like that experience really helped me to understand a little bit more about my gender Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I mean, when I think of the word somatic gender, I think of Ro, Ro Rose, who has coined that and offers that to folks all over, but especially in Montreal, where they're based out of. Well, I think gender is like if we can bring it back to the body, you mm-hmm. know, like if we can get it out of <laughs> the check boxes and the non consensual imp- imposing on babies, you know. Mm-hmm. If we bring gender into just our personal experience and say, what the fuck is it? There's just a way more freedom than like, oh God, what pronouns should I use? Like, I think that if we're guided by our bodies in whatever way that means, because not everybody has access all the time to body sensation, but noticing, like beginning to notice what gender, what gendered terms or seeing people who are differently gendered than you, like what does that invoke inside Mm -hmm. and that's that definitely was a part of my journey because I remember I had a lover who who started to say like I think I'm a (laughs) bae and this was before I allowed myself to explore my gender and I my body was sort of like shut that shut that down like that's not safe like they don't get to have that and man, it it was really hard. It's really hard to admit that. But that was a a turning point for me to realize like, wait, why am I sort of uncomfortable and wanting them to like not talk about this? Mm. Oh my God. It's actually because I haven't given myself permission to explore this. And what do I do now? Mm -hmm. It's like Pandora's box a little bit. Yeah. It can feel like that, especially when maybe... I mean, I haven't ever lived this life, but I think that there are a lot of people who live lives that are sort of set in in a type of like cis straight culture with jobs and kids and family that all expect certain things, or at least we think that they expect certain things. I'll just put an asterisk there. And the possibility of losing the sense of belonging or, you know, dignity, <laughs> um, privileges of our lives can be really hard to balance or navigate or decide to go against. And so I think community is really important. Um, Mm -hmm. People who are on that journey and can be peers, you know, with us in that question of, you know, what actually do I want in gender? You know, questions like, when did I first feel gendered? Like, what is that story? Where did that come from? Did I, how did I feel about that? when has gender actually served me? When has it felt limiting? Like, 
can the concept of gender as a spectrum liberate this idea of how I relate to people? So instead of if I am a woman and a man comes up to me and asks me to go out, I am I have this like way of relating to that based on like if I want to or not. I think that there's so many different ways that we get to relate if we see beyond those roles and those things that we've been told. So yeah. Again, trying to come back to the body, like the body, the body knows. I think a lot of it's just listening and mm-hmm. everybody has a different journey in how we get back to our own voice and our own choice and and what our body is like a hell yes to and a fuck no to. Yeah. And even like starting small, like picking out your outfit for the day and how that makes yeah. you feel like. I used to wear a bra every single day, a wire under bra. And like Oof. the last three years, I'm like, I don't think I've ever put one on. Like, and it's just, it didn't make me feel good, comfortable. Mm. So what was that for you? Like, how did you, what was that shift to cold turkey with this underwire bra? Like, what were those conditions that helped you make that choice? Well, a big part was getting out of the like oil and gas working in an office. Right. Mm -hmm. That was a big one. Mm -hmm. Like they require underwire bras. Well, I think it's just, you, you fit the role that Mm -hmm. you've been taught your entire life and just uh, like feeling like more comfortable, like going braless or at least wearing like a sports bra or something that was, yeah, Mm -hmm. I don't even remember the last time I wore one, but Just little things like that, I think it's just starting to notice how your body reacts to to experiences that you're having on this world, in your life. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I thought of one other story, actually, about my mustache, which I had, from a young age, been made fun of for, I would quote, unquote, upper lip hair, which is what, you know, all the stupid products out there say, like, eliminate your upper lip hair. So when I was a kid, I would be made fun of for it. And so I started to dye it, like bleach it, cut it, you know, pluck it, like try to get rid of this, this like Italian Jewish thing that is on my face. Like, damn it, ancestors, why did you give me this? (laughs) And over time, I started to question, why am I taking this away? And Mm -hmm. I had this thought like, oh, I'll let it grow when I'm like, later in life when I'm like in my 60s and you know I'm not looking to like get a partner (laughs) and then I was thinking what the fuck is that about like why am I thinking that I'm not attractive with a mustache and I can't find you know somebody that I would like to live a life with if I have it and I went to a queer ecstatic dance that I helped DJ and um during pride week many years ago and I had such a good time being in this like movement creature space of celebration of bodies and diversity. And after that, I decided not to trim it. And it was a body experience. It was just like, I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, I see you. Like, why Mm -hmm. am I taking, why am I taking you away? Like, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't line up with the values I have in my life. And so I started to let it grow out and really love started loving my mustache and calling it my mustache and like you know the first six months maybe really nervous like how people would receive me especially in the awkward like you know it's it's like kind of stubbly phase like ah what's you know I'm like going back to puberty (laughs) um but it was it was really wonderful to have friends notice it and be like oh I like that and oh you like you're growing a soul patch you know and and just supporting something that my body has been naturally doing like ever since I was 10 or 11 and reclaiming like this is something I actually really love and I think is is you know more part of me than I would have thought and a big turning point for me was when I put it on a I put a picture of me on a dating profile and the first picture was one that showed really showed kind of my whole face very close up which included the mustache and my now partner was the, one of the first people to reach out to me on that dating profile. And we ended up getting to like getting to know each other. And since then they shared that the, that picture and seeing my mustache was what drew them, drew them to me. And I was like, holy shit, that mustache is precious. 
<laughs> Thank you. Like, not only for me, <laughs> but you know, for this this very important person in my life to be drawn to me in ways that I was sort of scared, you know, is this gonna land for people that I want to be connected to? So yeah. Anyways, that was a body-based somatic experience of gender because you know mustaches are not about gender and they are you know well yeah like hair body hair in general is yeah. very gendered in my opinion like I finally started growing out my armpit hair and then I shaved because I was meeting my partner's mom and I didn't want her to make assumptions and then I felt really sad about it after like I was mm. I was like oh what did I do? Like, I really mm. enjoyed having my armpit hair. And <laughs> can I ask you what assumptions you were like scared that she would have about you? Like thinking it was gross thinking like, why are you with somebody who's like, okay, not saying this, but like dirty hippie, mm-hmm. like literally like I had fear around it. And I went back and forth. I'm like, do I shave it? Do I not shave it? Like it's hot. I'm obviously not going to wear something that covers it up. And, and I did, and I felt really like sad about it after. Mm. So mm. yeah. <laughs> Thank God it grows back. It does pretty quickly too. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. No, I was like, really, I really enjoy playing with the body hair. Uh, with my gender and mm-hmm. not conforming mm-hmm. to what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 One question I have is like, what, and this is going to lead into some other questions, but what role did other people play in you kind of understanding your journey? i um, like coming out, like sharing it to people. Cause that's a big one. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I have like, I can feel some blocks inside me, you know, like building blocks, <laughs> sort of clashing against each other with that question. But it's also really beautiful because the struggle is the journey and there were markers of support all along the way. And I first wanted to say like the people who didn't immediately understand when I started to say like, I'm going through something around gender, I don't know what it is, but can you you know, X, Y, Z, or can you use these words or can you see me this way? Or can you not do that? People who were like, what, (laughs) what do you mean this? Or, okay, well just tell me what to do. You know, people who were impatient with me or really had no context to gender journeys while it was really painful and hard at the time, I feel like they helped me go deeper with it. So you know, when I see people on social media, especially like coming out and being really loud and fierce and being like, I'm going to unfriend you if you don't understand me. I totally get that energy because I felt that too. And there is some benefit if we feel safe enough and we feel connected to the people that can support us to, to like let those questions land a little bit so that we have like more sense of what it is that we would say to that and, and what questions do we actually want to be asked. And what are those questions really showing about the other person? You know, it's not, especially for those of us who haven't been exposed to trans inclusivity and culture and queer culture, like there's going to be some really ignorant, harmful questions. And, you know, can we filter enough so that some of those questions actually lead us to epiphany and words that feel right and, and breaking some, (laughs) some like, I don't know, cancel culture tactics. So mm-hmm. I I have a few c- close friends who still don't really quite understand my gender journey. And I struggle with, you know, should I be close to them? Like, is it safe? You know, do they get me? I like come across articles I want to send them. And in some ways, there's something really beautiful about that because it's always sort of keeping me on my toes of like, well, what am I prescribing to in this like bubble of queer culture and trans life that actually isn't me, you know, but what is it that actually is important to me and my relationships and canceling folks is not for the most part. Although I've, anyways, I don't need to go down that road. I think it's a great point though. 
yeah, being able to be flexible and adaptable and um, open to some pushback, like open enough, you know, to, to have it grow a little bit more resilience and understanding for myself. So first off, I just want to say for those people who did push back and some of my family members are included in that list, like there, there was some usefulness in that. And, um, and then there were people who were just like, so on point, <laughs> there was folks in my community who had been on a gender journey and like started many different organizations and support groups and were just advocates. And I, there's one in particular, I would go to every time I saw them and just would like share, okay, now I'm noticing this. What do you think about that? How would you, you know, interact with that person? Like, you know, I'm feeling a lot of confusion about my chest or my voice. And, and they were so wonderful at normalizing it and like giving me some resources and cheering me on. And they ended up inviting me to play music at a really big event that was all for trans folks, right as I was starting to use the term trans for myself. And it was such an opportunity to show up and contribute to a community that I was like wanting to be a part of and that I admired and to play a song. I rewrote Ed Sheeran's Shape of You song to be about a love song for trans folks' bodies. And I got to perform this in like a pretty vulnerable way, like very fresh. I'd just like done it that week and be received by 200 people and that definitely was a big milestone for me and having a, a like a contribution you know and a place to like pour creativity into who I am becoming and who I want to be connected to and be received so shout out to Oblio for that <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of wonderful folks on Instagram who share about their journeys, their gender journeys, and do mm-hmm. a lot of activism around this. One of my favorites is Alok Manone, and they are just an incredible artist. They're really into fashion and modeling, and they also do these incredible book reports. So they read books all about like the history of racism and gender and you know colonialism, and they pour their love into summarizing what they heard, and they make it really beautiful, and they put it on Instagram. So I've been following Alok for a long time and um, I love what they do and what they offer and contribute to this culture. And then my coworkers, when I was coming out, I was trying on a new name, but I wasn't bringing that into the work environment. And I was at a Reverend Angel Kyoto Williams weekend retreat all about very much like embodied liberation around race and racism. And I started to use the name Jade that was like the first public place I was using Jade and I had a few coworkers there and I was like, Oh, this is edgy, but I'm going to do it. And one of them came up to me later and was like, so Jade, yeah, I like <laughs> it. Like, why haven't you shared that at work? And I was like, Oh, it feels really complicated and hard. And they happened to be in the communications department. So they were like, I will help you. And so we set up a meeting, you know, a few weeks later, and we mapped out all the things that would need to change um, on the website and the emails and communication and wow. how to do it in a like a pace that felt right for me. And yeah, it was such a beautiful gift that uh, this coworker Maya gave to me to really kind of bring multiple worlds together and be seen just as Jade because it was definitely becoming split world as I would go to work and answer the phone and and like have people you know come to me with a name that really felt like just a 10-15% of me not the whole enchilada I can totally feel you on that (laughs) yeah yeah wow so I'm I'm hearing community is a really big yes at least a good place to start with feeling resourced and yeah. and it can be online. Right. You know, and that's the beauty of right for folks who live away from big cities or don't have um, ability to leave their house. Like it's yeah. really there online too. And, and like, God, when we were, well, I don't know how old you are, but when I was younger, I certainly didn't have Instagram and Facebook groups <laughs> and TikTok and all of these places that were able to show me like what was possible and maybe 
question at a younger age how I felt about myself and my mm-hmm. gender and my sexuality. That was that I had to figure out on my own. And it took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, the power of being mirrored or seen representation or you know being witnessed in this part of ourselves is it's like it's on like we can't put a value on it it's so important and I think it builds up the resiliency to then be in a world that doesn't want to recognize it and be in connection with people that don't understand it because we have a little we have a little bit of that nourishment Mm -hmm. and that um, validation and then we can kind of go a little bit further out and not be destroyed and collapse when other people don't get it you know so right it is like a it's like a garden we got to water it with, <laughs> with like the water that we could drink you know yeah absolutely okay So I kind of shared a little bit of a dream project that I would like the sex positive socials. Um, What's a dream project that you'd like to see kind of more specifically surrounding gender? Yeah, so many. The (laughs) one that emerges right now is being able to weave stories together and interviews and like intimate moments with folks who live beyond the binary of gender to describe like what it is like internally and be able to share some of their creativity and magic and revelations and contributions and gifts and be able to weave that into video Mm. and share that with a, a larger audience, both, you know, of all genders. I think there's been so much emphasis on pronouns and names Uh, surgeries like very external things that are super important but there has been less shared information and storytelling around like what is the actual internal experience because if more people realize that like there's a lot going on all the time here I think more people are going to understand other folks who are in genderqueer beyond the binary trans identities they're going to they're going to feel connected to their stories and also they're going to start questioning their own feelings sensations questions and it just it feels like the progression like there's already this natural progression to be more transparent and intimate around what's going on from you know a trans lens and i just want to keep pushing that forward and in like a very um thoughtful consensual artistic way mm-hmm. So video is one medium that I love and have done some project work in and being able to leave people who are creative. And so like their music, their art, their dance, like that can be woven in. So you can kind of see like almost an expose of this person and how they live th- through their lives in this genderqueer way or whatever words they use and why and how that has come to be that just that really interests me. And I think that there's so much diversity in that. It will spark more and more people to understand and have empathy and go on their journeys too. I think that needs to be like a Netflix series. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it really came out of being asked pretty ridiculous questions from family members about gender when they, you know, when I started to talk to them about me and I was like, oh, you're really trying to know this. Mm. This is the question, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, like, can we actually answer those questions in the way that we want to be asked them, you know? And then can we have fun with it? So, yeah. You know, if I had ultimate, if I had infinite time and space, that would be what I would do tomorrow. Mm. Because I, I would love to meet more people and I'd love to create a, like, a juicy, supportive, fun environment for folks to share more about themselves in that way. I love that. Amazing. I definitely think you need to talk talk to Netflix about that. (laughs) Thanks for the the, uh, affirmation. All right. So in talking about this dream project that should be on Netflix, (laughs) you've also started a series of workshops called Pleasure Gendering. 
which I've seen on Instagram. Am I right? You've shared some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that for folks who might be interested in this? Sure. Yeah. It's um, an exploration as I've been studying somatic sex education and starting my own private practice, wanting to offer things for groups. And I think that kind of similar vein around the project idea, the video idea, like I want to explore fun and play and pleasure in the struggle of gender and ungendering or regendering or whatever it is that folks are doing. And so I've been designing a series of workshops for folks who are existing beyond the binary is kind of how I say it. Like you don't have to have labels. You could totally have labels. And like, if you feel like you exist beyond the binary, you're welcome here. And it's been really amazing. It's like, I start to think about okay, what do I need to like feel a celebration in this journey? That's hard. It feels like I'm, I'm sometimes just working like double time to be in the world and be myself and be an integrity and, you know, change culture. So it's movement based, it's reflection based, it's community. It's like small groups, big groups. I've had like really juicy music in it and it's just a way to explore gender without the pressures of being in um, like cis space mostly and then having to have, you know, the one or two trans folks find each other and be like, will you be in my small group for this? Right. Yeah. That makes and sense. And explore, particularly explore pleasure as a non-binary experience. So thinking about pleasure in the body as both upregulating and downregulating like we need to feel that like adrenaline excitement and we also need to feel that like oxytocin like ah uh, like i'm 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 in something that's like safe enough to do what i want to do and so i feel like pleasure is non-binary and to be able to explore that with a group of people who identify beyond the binary just feels like that's right that's what i, what I want to do so i'm just at the beginning journeys of offering that through Rhythm Liberation, which is the, the name of my private practice. And most of the events are, um, I've done one online and I'm going to do one in person pretty soon. So mm, that was my question. Yeah. Online can like provide a type of privacy. That's really nice, you know, to explore and go a little bit deeper, but in person has obviously like a whole nother plethora of things that can be done, both engaging with others and just having you know, not on screen. So yeah, that's, that's one thing that's been percolating and coming forward. So in the next few months, this is something that you'll still continue to offer. Yeah. I mean, I think this will be an undercurrent to other group offerings and the private practice that I'm working with individuals on. So, you know, people want to check out my website, which is rhythmliberation.com. I have an events page that will have whatever's coming up. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. That sounds so Mm -hmm. exciting. (laughs) I hope that some people are and feel a little bit of a stirring to go check that out because I do. I mean, that sounds Mm. very cool. (laughs) Yeah. I'd love to have you. I want to do the live one, but we're the (laughs) in-person one, but um, (laughs) online can do for now. Although I would love to go down to Portland one day. So I'd like to switch gears into the Instagram Q and a, uh, so every show I ask followers just what their questions are surrounding a specific topic of the person that I'm interviewing. So I have three pretty good questions. Yeah. And I'll just ask them. And if you feel like you don't have the capacity or availability to answer them right now, that's totally okay. You don't have to. So the first question is, I'm cisgendered, but lately I've been wondering if I really feel this way about myself. How can I truly find out if I feel me as cisgendered? Mm, Yes. I'm so happy this person asked this question and is just asking this question in general. I would say go to, like, if you can find events in 
the area that you live in or go travel and go to like community art art events or performances, drag shows. You know, there's like a queer makers art fair coming up in Portland. Things where people are mostly not cisgendered <laughs> who are like offering their skills and their contributions. Like go and be with that, go sit in that amphitheater, go like support and like receive art from folks who are exploring gender differently. Not only to like contribute to something, but to be available to what your body has to say. Like, how do you feel in those spaces? Are there things that draw you? Are there things that you want to try? Are you like scared of something? Does something feel like too edgy? But um, just like begin to immerse yourself in physical space if that's possible, that's run by trans and non-binary folks. Of course, there's like tons of media and books and things to like I was gonna learn say. about. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe like exploring something that's for folks who are exploring gender, you know, maybe there are other workshops out there around exploring beyond the binary. Even your workshop. Yeah, I mean, my art workshop does invite folks who are like, wait a minute, <laughs> what is this gender thing? What have I been doing for all these years? Yeah. And, you know, I don't have an agenda. I just want to say, like, if somebody goes through a gender journey and they realize, oh, this is who I am. I am cis. Like, I want, I want, I want that too. Like, I want people to celebrate who they are. They don't, not everybody has to bust out of boxes, you know. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has gone through a gender journey, likely they'll have some empathy and understanding and advocacy for folks who also are on that journey or their own journey. So I think it's valuable for everybody if they have the time and space. And that's a whole thing of like, do we have the privilege to be able to do that amongst the other identities and struggles that we live in? But if folks do, like, I think it's a worthwhile experience, even if you come back to square one. <laughs> right. And don't be afraid to reach out to organizers too. Yeah. Like ask questions if you like are unsure about something or, or you, you feel something might be too edgy and you're not sure if that's going to be there. Mm -hmm. Like maybe an event you're like, I don't know if this means that we're going to be getting nude, like ask mm -hmm. these questions. And usually organizers are pretty good about answering them and offering you what you need to make the decision for yourself if that's the space for you mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and if you don't know am I actually invited in like if I don't have the labels can I come right asking organizers that too I think is it's a beautiful you know request for do I get an invite or not I think that's wonderful to check in about instead of just assume that we're not you know yeah yeah like I know that was a big thing for me is if, is there gatekeeping? Am I allowed to be at this event? Mm -hmm. Because I don't know my identity or mm -hmm. I know that it's this right now, but I don't know for sure. So mm -hmm. yeah. And don't be, don't be afraid to reach out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Question two, how can I support a partner who is exploring gender expression that is now different compared to when we first started dating slash were together? Yay. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like opportunity for allyship and some yes. real impact. So I think, you know, starting with a sense of like, what is embodied consent? And I know this is like, seems like left field, but um, thinking about gender and gendering as like, we can reclaim consent around our gender. So for a partner to be patient with that process of somebody who's exploring, like they may not know the words or the labels they want and it may change over time. So like having patience with people in their process and understanding that consent is an ongoing set of choices. And so, you know, to say like, this person is this right now, okay, what choices make sense for you now? Being able to check in and have that understanding that things are changing and things may not feel the same in somebody's body the next day. It's super important bringing that just like care for this person's reclaiming of their gendering and the consent around gendering. It's a beautiful opportunity. And also to like have enough self-awareness of like, when does 
when does discomfort come up for for you you know like when is what your partner doing might feel a little too edgy for you or like are you gay now or whatever the thing is like be aware of your own biases and discomfort and maybe have other people you can lean on to talk Mm -hmm. about that with Mm -hmm. maybe you have other friends who are closely connected to trans folks or you have trans folks who are down to talk to you about that Mm -hmm. being able to not bring that to your partner because it will definitely influence my guests influence them either in saying fuck you I'm doing it or like oh maybe I will lose this love connection if I you know go this direction yeah I'll shrink myself to yeah appease your fears or yeah yeah Mm -hmm. and I think another piece is just to understand the ridiculousness of the binary and like that it is a colonial construct and we can join the human rights movement and say like I don't I don't think that there's only two options here and we can honor people who want to be on one side or the other or shift to one side or the other. And we can also honor the people who land in the middle or don't even land on the spectrum. And so, you know, just understanding, having some basic understanding of like what, (laughs) what happens in the womb, in the fetus that then like our Western culture deems as female or male through just one expression, which is like genitals, when there's so many other things going on, like hormones and chromosomes and, (sighs) you know, soul level things, uh, felt sense, socialization. And so just getting more and more comfortable with like out of the binary, out of the boy or the girl and seeing the ridiculousness of that. So you can join the like fluidity or like the shift that your partner is going through could be super helpful. And then I would, I would say like, explore your own relationship, like see this as an opportunity if you haven't already to just like ask questions of your own gender and um, Mm -hmm. like why, you know, do you feel as solid as you do in who you are? And if you do, that's great. And you can, you know, pour a lot of that attention and love into helping your partner. And maybe there's some things that stir in you too. And this could be an opportunity to like dive a little deeper and share more intimacy around that with your partner. So, yeah, I think that oftentimes when I like think about gender and people ask me like, what is gender? What I come to is it's just like a a idea of how we relate to each other, to the world, to fashion, to like, all these things it's like a way to categorize how we relate so that we can understand like oh you are this and so I relate to you this way and being on a gender journey really shakes that and so folks who are not on that journey but closely connected to someone who is the question is usually like how do I relate to you right (laughs) you know like what are the how can I be politically correct or like you know unoppressive or not harm you and it comes from a place of care but often people get stuck in this idea of doing it the right way and they're not actually attuned and attuning to the person and the relationship and it's becomes more sort of like this ego like panic than oh I'm super curious like I want to be here with you and I'm going to make mistakes and right and like and I'm going to follow up and be connected and and like make repair as needed and so I think just having that spirit of like this is an opportunity and things are going to change. Like the world is changing. People are deciding, you know, that they don't need to be in boxes and we can get on the bandwagon with them in whatever way feels right for now. Right. Totally. And there's not like a perfect way to be no. there for your partner. Either. No, and we need to, to ditch the perfectionism. And like, that's something we learn about in school. Like, Mm -hmm. no, there's no perfect way to do this. There's, you're going to screw up. There's going to be something that's said or done or Mm -hmm. portrayed and having that space. Like, I I like the idea of doing check-ins even and, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. like taking listening turns and like just checking in with each other, you know, a set, set a time that feels right for you every second day, every week every two weeks, like what feels good for you and Mm -hmm. honoring that in each other. 
I mean, that's what we did in non-monogamy for a long time was check-ins and that <laughs> helped to diffuse a lot of like the bigger things that could have happened. Cause I'm like, oh, we're having like this conversation. You're listening. I'm listening. And once you start talking, sometimes you realize then that there was things that you didn't even realize that needed to be said or things that you were mm-hmm. feeling until mm-hmm. you were in that safe space to have that conversation. Personally, that's yeah. Totally. Yeah. Container. Container. That's the word. <laughs> yeah. It's been a journey for me to learn the importance of containers, but damn, it's, it changes everything. Right. Yes. I also wanted to say one more thing for the partner or for the person who's holding space for this partner on this journey or is alongside them just to, to like understand that this person may be needing to connect closely with other folks on similar journeys Mm -hmm. and that they may not share everything with you and that's okay I remember that in my experience like I it took me a while to say some of the things that I was going through to my partner and when I would tell them they were like oh my god I didn't know but I was like I needed somebody further along on their journey to be able to say this and be validated and reflected to then own it and like bring it to people who may have not had this experience before so just giving a little bit of like support and acceptance and space to how your partner might be moving towards certain community members or events and, and like knowing that that's, that's good. You know, that's really, they're finding what they need. That's great. Thank you for adding it. That's super helpful. Sometimes people, they internalize it. They're like my ego. (laughs) totally it's really easy to do yeah when when change is happening it's like what's wrong with me but yeah again like finding support for your own insecurities you know is is, can be helpful so you're not bringing that into the relationship yeah that's great thank you okay third and final question do I have to have surgery to be considered trans oh I feel so tender hearing that question yeah. Because there's such a there's such a message around again this imposed binary like trans or not. Um, am I queer enough or am I not? Do I belong here? Do I not? And mm-hmm. that gatekeeping, it's like it's it's in all these like amazing subcultures as well. So mm-hmm. that question feels very uh, heartbreaking to hear, and it's also so relevant. And I mean, of course, my answer is fuck no (laughs) what we do with our bodies is our choices and you know there's gonna be people who see that differently and who think what they've done is the one right way and or if you don't do something and you don't you they don't perceive you as something then you know it's your fault like there's gonna be haters (laughs) there's gonna be dissidents we're not void of the same pitfalls that cis culture perpetuates so again like what can you do to understand what you want and it sounds like this person has been exploring that and feeling like maybe they don't want surgery and um, that's perfectly fine I think the medical industrial complex is a big proponent for taking our money and doing things to our bodies and we don't need to go that direction if we don't feel like we want to Mm -hmm. if we feel really drawn to it like please explore it but if you if you don't don't do it now you know don't do it because it marks something that you may regret later I think like being in community and having these conversations and feeling connected to what feels right for you is way more important than showcasing or performing or (laughs) being seen in the world as a particular gender or you know a particular fashion that fits this this way of being and yeah I just want to invite people to like slow down that process because it is it is a big decision and it's a fucking beautiful decision if we say yes to and it also has like long-term consequences if we decide we don't want it and sometimes we can do surgeries that we can change from and it's not a final decision and that's good to know like what the considerations are you know long term living with whatever you got um whatever surgeries you have but 
in no way in my eyes do I see that if somebody is not choosing to go a medical route, are they any less than who they say they are? Right. I would even go as far as to say, I think it would be a really great opportunity to work with a somatic sex educator who really niches in gender exploration to like before having a surgery Mm, Um, and just understanding how to feel into your body and how you feel about that. And if it's right for you, because I think it is a really big decision. Fuck. I did laser hair removal on my pussy and I regret that now, you know, like, Mm. like, yeah, there's still hair, but it wasn't what it used to be. And like, that's not as big as having a surgery as like on your genitals or your chest. And it's a big choice. And I think that working with somebody who can help you really dive into that, that choice and voice in your body is Mm -hmm. an extraordinary gift. Mm -hmm. And there's more people like that available now more than ever. So it's not a decision you have to make on your own and feeling isolated, like talk to lots of people, use your resources. Yeah. And, you know, if it's, if this practice is possible for you, or you feel like you'd want to explore it, like tune into your ancestors, because medicalization is relatively new for gender reassignment or gender affirming surgery. Like, we have ancestors who live their lives in ways that we, you know, we would never imagine without those types of support and access. Mm-hmm. And um, can we, you know, if we're, if we're leading away from surgery, can we invite those guides in? Can we like feel wow. that solidarity and be in the, in the magic of like the imaginal and the astral and the ways that we get to shape shift and also like discomfort for me, like the, the dysphoria that I experience it's like my body map in my head and my body like does not match my physical body and and I think like you said like finding somebody who can hold space for you in understanding what your body map is and how you can play with it and maybe it's just never going to be satisfying and you do want to move towards something on the medical side and that's great and there's other options to explore before that decision is made so like tuning into body maps, I think can be so helpful before making decisions that, you know, either are like really financially strenuous and or physically changing. Yeah. Yeah. I follow quite a few Twitter feeds of trans people who have gone through surgery and I'm like, Oh, wow. Like it's pretty intense. I'm like, yeah, it's a lot of time and energy and care and support yeah. needed. And yeah you know, and it can be the most beautiful thing that somebody goes through and feels like who they finally are, Mm -hmm. you know, at the end. So it really is, is an individual choice. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Jade. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for today too. This has been a wonderful conversation. I would love for you to just drop some of your handles. I know you mentioned your website. I'll share all of that info on the show notes as well. But do you have like an Instagram that you want to share or something like that? Yeah, just finding me on Instagram is Rhythm Liberation. And that's my website as well. It's pretty straightforward. I don't have a ton of social media energy. So Instagram (laughs) is the only one that I allow myself to be consumed by every now and then. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll make sure to share that in the show notes and thank you everyone for tuning in today. It was, can I, can I share the song? Oh yes, please, please, please. Okay, great. It's, it's a song that I feel like kind of wraps up a lot of what we were talking about today. And, um, it's just an acapella song that came to me when I was on some really beautiful land that a friend's farm has um, up in Washington. And it came out of a conversation. Somebody was like, what is gender? What is gender? And I was like, God damn it. I think it's false, but I, but maybe it's about relating and understand having an anchor to like, how do we relate? So that's the context that this song was born. It was 
early COVID era, so in 2020. Mm. <sighs> Gender is a funny thing. I do believe the bells can ring. If we get space to play beyond what's assigned at birth. Fear is not an obstacle if loving hands are here to hold. Baby steps into unknown. Who are you in the gender free world? Elemental flow. Blending of my toes, mixing up the matrix of the essential properties. Let's be real, we are made of many things, and if we explore what that means, we will compost colonial tendencies and call back our connection to freedom in our bodies freedom in our choices freedom in our loving freedom in how we relate how we relate how we relate mm -hmm. I love it. Wow. Thank you. You have a beautiful voice. Mm, thank you. So I think we're just going to say adios. Bye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. Thank you to all of my amazing listeners for tuning in to the Sex Ed for the Modern Bed Show. If you're looking for more ways to connect and access information, get social with me. You can follow the show's Instagram at the.sexed.show or my individual Instagram at sexedforthemodernbed. <laughs> <laughs>